So, like my whole life, um, Christmas, I'm, I'm big on Christmas, I'm big on Christmas things, and I, I like Christmas movies, especially the old ones. Um, and so, It's a Wonderful Life, anybody ever see that? A bunch of you? I never did. And I love Christmas movies. Now, I knew things about It's a Wonderful Life, and I knew the ending and the punchline and kind of what it sort of was about. And about two years ago, I actually watched it, and I was amazed that, like, there's a lot of story besides the, the punchline at the end and a couple of scenes that I must have walked in on when somebody else was watching it. Um, Esther's kind of like that. A lot of people know the punchline, like two verses out of the 10 chapters of Esther. And then when you talk about like there's a whole story behind it, and when you sit down, it's like, oh, wow, I, I, I never knew it was this good. And so I want to I wanna give you a little bit of Esther this morning, 10 chapters in about 20 minutes, and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap it up with a couple thoughts at the end. But in order to appreciate the message of Esther, we need to understand the story a little better. So if you've heard it before, be patient. Um, if you haven't, pay close attention. There's a bunch of names, and it can get a little confusing. Um, and um, we're, we're going we're gonna to try to make our way through here. So this is not a typical Mother's Day sermon. I was assigned this morning to give you all my expertise on how to be a mother. Um, <laughs> Rather than that, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go a little broader, and we're going to talk about Esther. So this applies not just to moms and grandmas, and, but to all women and young people and men. Um, I hope we can learn and, and grasp the message that God wants to bring to us through Esther, who we don't know if she ever was a mother or not. I don't know that history ever tells us. The Bible doesn't. Um, but she's a godly woman in the end that um, we need to learn from today. So um, you're not going to be able to follow me really verse by verse, but we're going to start in chapter one, um, book of Esther. Let me give you a little bit of background story. Uh, you may be familiar with Nebuchadnezzar. He was a uh, king over Babylon, um, and so it was a world empire. And we know his story a little bit uh, through the book of Daniel, especially when uh, we read about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in a fiery furnace. We were about Daniel and a lion's den and, and other events like that that are kind of well-known stories. So that's under the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar. That's when, uh, not long after that, the kingdoms, the empires were shifting from Babylon to Persia, Medo-Persian Empire. And so from there, uh, we go to uh, the Persian ruler Cyrus. And so Babylon falls under him. Um, so under Nebuchadnezzar, the people of God and Judah were, were being attacked. Ultimately, they were brought under God's judgment and into exile. They were taken to Babylon, um, and there they lived for 70 years. Under the new Persian king, Cyrus, um, they were given a promise that they could go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the city and rebuild the temple. And so uh, over the course of time under this new uh, Persian ruler, um, they were released to go back, and about 50,000 Jews went back to Jerusalem. But about a million Jews stayed scattered throughout Persia. Now, we have a map, I think, um, is that what I'm getting to next? Yeah, we have a map up here. And this gives you the scope of the Persian Empire. So in all the colored sections there, so um, this empire went from Ethiopia in Africa all the way to Pakistan and to, toward India. And so this was basically the world as we knew it then. And Xerxes, who in the book of Esther, uh, is referred to as Ahasuerus, was the king and ruler at the time, and that's where we pick up in the book of Esther, chapter 1. So we have a million Jews scattered throughout Persia, and we want to see three things today, God's providence, Satan's plot, and then God's sovereign protection. So we start moving quickly. Uh, I'll introduce you to two people 
first, and then we'll get to chapter one. The first is Esther, the star, and that's literally what her name means, the star of this story. Esther is her Persian name. Hadassah is her Jewish name. Chapter two, verse seven tells us that she was a young woman. She had a beautiful figure, and she was lovely to look at. Hold on to that because it's going to make sense in a few minutes. She was also an orphan. And so her cousin, Mordecai, was a bit older than her, lived through the exile, but now was raising Esther as his own child. And so they had a very close relationship. Back to chapter 1, we're introduced to the king, Ahasuerus, and his wife, Queen Vashti. Chapter 1 opens up with a feast, six months long. Now, this wasn't just for the sake of a party. This feast was a summit. It was a war summit. They had just, uh, well, um, not just, but in the past had conquered the Babylonian Empire. But now they were also facing the next rising empire, Greece. And so they were in uh, war plans to try to hold on to the power that they had in the land um, and so six months of political maneuvering, trying to get the people behind them, and so big celebrations and kind of giving a lot of things to get uh, support behind you. And then at the end of those six months, they had a one-week feast where this was kind of a thank you to his palace officials and those who put this all on, those closest to him, again, trying to buy some allegiance. And this, we're told, was a drunken orgy, basically, uh, for seven days. And in the middle of this, um, the king thought it would be a good idea to bring his wife Vashti, the queen, into this celebration of mostly drunken men and show her off. Well, she wasn't real keen on that, probably for several reasons, and she refused the king and said, I'm not going to show up to your party, and of course, the king was mad, and it caused a bit of a stir and a problem for the king, and his advisor says, if we don't deal with this, we're going to have a mess on our hands. There's going to be a women's liberation movement across the empire <laughs> that we don't want to deal with, and so they come up with the idea that we need now to um, send a decree throughout 127 provinces of their empire. And so um, what they said is, uh, this is chapter 1, verse 20, if you want to underline this, men, um, all the women will give honor to their husbands, high and low alike. And in verse 22, the letter and decree to every household in the land was that every man be master in his own household. Okay. Since it's Mother's Day, we'll just move on from there <laughs> and go to chapter 2. After some time, the king is wanting a queen. He had a harem, but it wasn't the same as having somebody next to you on the throne and uh, the status of that. And so he decides that he's going to have a beauty contest, basically. And so word goes out through the kingdom that um, all of his leaders are to scan the population and find the loveliest, prettiest, most gracious women and pick them out and send them to the capital city, Susha, or Sushan, and um, there, they were pretty much just going to kind of go down this crowd. Now, there were about 50 million people in, in uh, the Persian uh, population. And so if half of them were women, there's, there's a lot of women, 25 million uh, girls, women, that were going to be kind of scanned and selected and sent to a harem type situation and from there they would be whittled down and so they had this beauty contest and uh, these beautiful young virgins were selected and uh, then they were put through a regimen for 12 months a year they went through beauty treatments we, we read in esther oils and spices and ointments. There were protocols and etiquette they needed to learn. If you're going to be the queen, there's a way you need to carry yourself. And so for 12 months, 
they prepped and they primped. So men, don't complain when your wife's a little bit long getting ready in the morning. <laughs> it takes some time. Ultimately, this young Jewish girl that we were introduced to, um, Esther, was selected, attracted, and got hold of the king's heart, and she is now the queen. Mordecai, her cousin, all along the way from childhood and now in this process, had instructed her, don't tell anyone you're Jewish. There'd be a problem in the culture, uh, and particularly in, in rising into prominence, um, don't disclose it. So this was a secret. But along with Esther's rise into royalty, um, her cousin Mordecai benefited from that, and it seemed like he was put into some prominent places, and he ends up in the, in the, in the um, area of the palace and in the courtyards and by the gate of the king's palace. And as he's there one day, he hears two soldiers that are having conversation and plotting to assassinate King Ahasuerus. So Mordecai goes to his cousin, Esther, who's the queen, and tells him of the plot. She goes to the king and says, there's an assassination plot. He sends out investigators. It's confirmed. These two guards are hanged. And as was custom, um, they recorded this incident in the book of their chronicles or the record of the kings. And so in there was the two names of these men and what had happened and Mordecai rescued the king, saved the king and they were punished and all. And so it was tucked away and put away and we'll hold on to that as we go to chapter three. This is where um, the plot thickens. There's a man by the name of Haman who's introduced to this story. Haman the Agagite. There are several times in the book of Esther that it's, uh, Haman is referred to specifically as an Agagite. It seems like that's a significant fact that God wants us to know. So I'll share it with you. Who is, what is an Agagite? Well, if you go back to the Exodus, in the book of Exodus, um, as people, children of God, are going through the wilderness, coming from Egypt into the promised land. They're warring other nations. And uh, as they're off to war with um, nations, the Amalekites kind of sneak attack. There are women and children vulnerable because most of the men are off at war. And so um, they're defeated there. There's slaughter there. And God is angry at the Amalekites. God says, I'm going to wipe them off the face of the earth. And God takes a moment in Saul's life, King Saul, to do that. And so he commands Saul to go against the Amalekites. And you may remember that story. He says, I want you to kill every man, every woman, every child, every animal, anything living associated with the Amalekites, destroy them. So Saul goes and does that, almost. He doesn't kill all the animals, when the prophet Samuel came and said, is, is the job done? And Saul says, yeah, I've, I've, I've done all that God has said. And then the prophet starts to hear the sheep bleeding and the cows mooing and says, what's this that I hear? And Saul begins to try to justify um, his disobedience and, and saying, well, I thought I'd save the best for God and we can sacrifice these animals. And okay, um, although that wasn't, obedience, and he was going to be judged for that, um, but also I saved the king of the Amalekites, and uh, we, he could be useful to us, and the king's name was Agag. Well, Samuel was not pleased, God was not pleased, and Samuel proceeded then to hack this king of the Amalekites, Agag, into pieces. 500 years later, there's a descendant of that king of the Amalekites, Agag. His name is Haman. There's also a descendant of King Saul, whose father's name was Kish, and they were from the tribe of Benjamin. His name is Mordecai. So there's a 500-year feud that is brewing here in the city of Susha between Haman and Mordecai 
and they both knew it. Haman, uh, Mordecai won't bow down to Haman. Now, Haman is basically the second in command under Ahasuerus. And so when Haman walks the streets, everybody steps back. Everybody bows to him. Everybody pays homage to him except Mordecai. And Haman is getting angrier by the day. And so Haman decides that he needs to get rid of Mordecai. His anger is just brewing. And so he comes up with a plot and a scheme to kill not just Haman, uh, not just Mordecai, because they said if you do that, we'll still have the rest of the population to deal with, and you'll just anger them. We need to destroy all of the Jews, a million of them from Africa to India. And so um, they begin to devise the plan to exterminate the Jews. And they draw lots, Haman draws lots to determine the day on which that would happen. He goes to the king to get permission. Ahasuerus gives him a signet ring um, and permission to send this written edict throughout the land to destroy to kill and to annihilate all Jews, young and old, women and children. That's chapter 3, verse 13. Now we move to chapter 4. Mordecai, of course, is inconsolable. It's um, a death sentence, not just for him and his family, but for every Jew. Mordecai commands Esther to go to the king, beg his favor, and plead with him. Now we're in chapter 4. This is where I I want you to have your Bibles open to because this is one of those verses that we've all heard of in the middle of this story that maybe we've not made connection with. Go to the king and beg him for our lives. Esther pushes back. I can't go to the king. There's a law of the Medes and the Persians. You don't get audience with the king unless you've been given invitation. If I go there and his scepter hasn't been extended, that I could go into his presence, I'll be killed like every other person who tries to uh, gain access to the king's presence. And so I, I can't go to the king. He didn't summon me. And so we read in chapter 4, verse 13, then Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, Do not think to yourself that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. And who knows, Esther, whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Esther agrees, but says you need to call the entire people, all of the Jews, to fast for three days. And then in verse 16, I will go to the king, though it is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. The old translations, most translations we're familiar with, Um, Who knows whether you've come to the kingdom for such a time as this. The message I've titled just to kind of make it maybe a little bit more contemporary. Made for this moment. Esther's made for this moment. In chapter 5, we turn toward the conclusion of the story, though it's far from over. Sovereign protection. Uh, Chapter 6 begins... Uh, or chapter 5 and 6, with parties, more parties. Uh, Esther goes to the king and makes a request. Now she's pleading for the life of her people. And he says, there's anything you want up to half my kingdom, it's yours. She says, I I just want to have a party, and I want to invite you to the party, and I want to invite Haman to the party. And so um, they scheduled and planned the party, and they show up, that night, and the, um, the party is going okay, but somehow, some way, we're not told, there must have been a snag in this 
plan for Esther to tell the king and beg for their lives. And so she just kind of, it, it just ends abruptly. Nothing happens. And so um, she says, well, I'd like you to come back tomorrow for another party. And again, the guests of honor are going to be the king and Haman. And so Haman leaves that first party that night, and he's all excited because he's, he's like singled out. It's the king and the queen and him. And so he's feeling very big and proud and powerful. And so he leaves the party, the first one, and as he's going home, he passes by Mordecai. And Mordecai does the same thing he always does. He ignores and disrespects Haman, doesn't bow, doesn't pay him any honor or recognition, and now Haman is fuming. He goes home. His wife, what's, what's the matter? His advisors, they come up with a plan. She says, you've got to get rid of him. You've got to kill him. So he decides he's going to build the, the gallows, and the next morning he would go to King Ahasuerus, and he would tell him that here's a disrespectful man and I need to put him to get to death and get his permission. So he spends the night planning and plotting and waiting for the morning in the palace. Now, if this were a soap opera, um, <laughs> if, if it were a book you read, you wouldn't believe any of this, okay? That night in the palace, the king can't sleep. So he's wrestling and tossing and he's turning and finally, you know, you get to that point, it's like it's useless. Let me just get up and do something. Maybe you count sheep. What the king decided to do that night was to read the book of Chronicles. Nobody reads the book of Chronicles. <laughs> that will put you to sleep. And here is the record that the king says, I just want this read back to me. So as he's half asleep and they come in with the books and they open the record of the kings and they begin to read and they come across the entry that talks about the plot to assassinate the king. And it gives the names of the guards. And then it gives the name of the man, Mordecai, who, who uncovered this plot and saved the king's life. That woke the king up. And he said, what was done to honor this man, Mordecai? And his advisors and counselors said, nothing was done. So he says, well, we need to fix that. So the night passes, the morning comes, and Haman shows up to the king's palace to, to ask permission to kill Mordecai and hang him on the gallows. But before he could say anything to the king, the king asks him a question. He says, what should be done to the man who the king delights to honor? Haman, thinking he's talking about himself, says, I think you should put royal robes on him, robes that you yourself wore. And I think he should get on your very horse, and you should put your royal crown, one that you have worn, on his head. And I think somebody of great authority ought to lead that horse and parade him through the streets of the city and proclaim, quote, thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. Hajuera <laughs> said, that's a good plan. <laughs> Haman, would you please go get Mordecai? Put the robes and the crown on him. Set him on my horse. And you, Haman, grab the bridle of the horse... <laughs> And you parade him through the city streets and say, this is what's done to the man whom the king delights to honor. It's not working out well for Haman. Party number two that night, and Esther reveals that there's this plot, and um, the edict has gone out that every Jew throughout your kingdom is to be killed, exterminated on this day. And then she tells the king, I'm a Jew. Well, the king's now beside himself. He's been had. The law of the Medes and the Persians, once a law has been decreed, it cannot be rescinded. So this stands. Every Jew will die. He goes out trying to compose himself, trying to figure out what to do. In the meantime, in the party, 
in, in the room, um, Haman is begging Esther for his life. And he is somehow demonstrative, we're not told what, but he's getting very close and possibly very physical, and it happens to be an, on, on the couch and the chairs, and, and the king walks back in on this scene, and he sees Haman with the queen, and he's outraged, and he says, uh, and she reveals, this is the man who, who set up this whole scheme, and so a Haman is sentenced to death, executed on the gallows that he had built the day before for Mordecai. And so there's the end of Haman's life. But there's still a problem. There's still a law. And there's still a date on the calendar for the destruction of the Jews. So the king and his advisors came up with a way to try to help, and they gave an edict again across the land that every Jew is able to arm himself and prepare himself for that day of battle, and they can war against the Persians and defend themselves. On that day, that's exactly what happened, and the Jews defeated those who would dare come against them, and um, their lives were preserved, and thousands upon thousands of Persians that attacked them, their enemies were killed. And on that day, 10 of Haman's sons were also hanged. There's a great celebration. Um, there's joy and happiness and feasting and a holiday that was established that day. And it's celebrated to this day. It's called the Feast of Purim. Somebody you familiar with that? Um, that's the story, and that's the celebration. So um, the, the word poor, P-U-R, Purim is P-U-R-I-M. So P-U-R refers to the lots that were cast by Haman to determine what day the Jews would be killed. On that day, the Jews were victorious, and so they celebrate the day that the lots were cast the Feast of Purim. It's interesting, we happened to be the pastors uh, from this church, went to Israel back in March, and while we were there was when they were celebrating the Feast of Purim for two days, they celebrate. And so the first thing that we ate in Israel, we came out of the airport into the, our tour guide's van in the airport garage, and he pulls out this package of pastries, and he passes it around to us, um, and uh, he said, this is what we eat for the Feast of Purim. And so I knew what this pastry was because from my German an ancestry, where you know there are a lot of Jews in Germany, um, so there's a tradition there as well, my family, my grandmother, um, and then mother would always have these pastries. They are called Hamantaschen in German. Now, Hamantaschen is spelt H-A-M-A-N. Okay. And Hamantaschen means Haman's ear. And so it's like a poppy seed pastry. It's a triangle shape. And there are a lot of stories behind it. But the, the Haman's ear story, the day of Purim that, we, that the Jews celebrate, uh, speaks of um, the, the Haman's ear kind of being twisted and bent over in shame. And so instead of him being set up as power and, uh, and, and pomp in the kingdom, he, he was shamed. And so to celebrate the victory of the Jews on Purim, we eat Haman's ear. The end of the story in chapter 9 and 10, Mordecai is promoted in the kingdom and he ranks second to King Ahasuerus. Okay, that brings us to the end. What's that all about? Not a lot of mother story in here. There's not a lot of how, how to be a better mother and how to raise your kids and that kind of thing. Um, but it speaks to a woman um, and a man that found their place in the kingdom of God. Um, and there are some lessons this morning that I'd like to close with. Um, 
the first lessons about God. Um, one is God is sovereign. We see the providence of God behind the scenes that we're not even aware of. You read through the story, and, and we read through a lot of things, whether bi- a Bible or, or extra biblical. We, we read through things, and um, we, we get through it real fast. We flip through it. We heard that story page by page. And they may be living decades in the story, and we're done in a half an hour like this morning, and we've got the whole thing all wrapped up. Um, but there's a lot of things going on in this story that they're living out without any idea what God is doing. And he's providentially setting some things up in their lives and in history that they're unaware of. There are ways that God acts sovereignly, miraculously. Providentially, we, we, we mostly don't know. Sometimes we can look back on our lives and say, okay, now that makes sense and that makes sense. And going through it, we just thought we were living life. And that's what Esther thought she was living, and Mordecai thought they were living. But God's setting some things up to work providentially and sovereignly. And if, and if you could see maybe behind the scenes, I can almost envision Satan and God sitting across each other at a table with a chessboard and maneuvering and trying to put pieces in place and positions for conquest and defeat. And I'll steal this from you, and I'll take that from you. Um, because you, you see, this, this story of Esther is not about Esther. It's not about Mordecai or Haman or Ahasuerus. It's, it's none of those characters. This is a story of God, a big story of God. You see, in the very beginning in the garden, Genesis chapter 3 tells us that after man sinned, God came into a garden and pronounced judgment on the devil and said, I'm going to crush your head. I'm going to send a deliverer that's going to redeem my people and restore this relationship. And it's going to come through a promise that I'm going to fulfill through Noah and through Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and David. And, and, it's, going to, and it's going to flow all the way through the bloodline until a young virgin named Mary and her father, earthly father Joseph are going, to, are going to bring into this world a son who will redeem this world. And the devil from the beginning of time, from that moment, the devil knew, I've got to stop the bloodline. The story of Esther is about the devil trying to crush God's plan of salvation, redemption, and God sitting on the other side of the table. When the devil says check, God says checkmate. He never loses. God never loses. In this book of Esther, there's not a mention of God. Read the 10 chapters. There is no mention of God whatsoever. He's not He's, he's not in focus. He's not in the picture. There's, there's no talk. There's no consideration. But we see the hand of God. We see him putting things in place. And, and his working is evident in every single detail. We see it in the lives and stories of so many throughout Scripture and so many throughout history and so many in this room today. God, though he may not be seen, we sing that song, don't we? We sing so many good songs. Don't, don't, just, kind of, don't just feel the songs. Know the songs. Hold, get hold because they're telling a truth. When we sing songs like, even when you don't see him, he's working. Even when you don't feel him, he's working. He never stops. He never stops. He never stops working. This is the sovereign hand of God in every life in this room today. How do we apply this? Just two and a half things to end. The half a thing, just a side note. Um, Beware of being at home outside the presence and the will of God. A million Jews stayed scattered throughout Persia Instead of going back to the city of God, Jerusalem, and his presence and his dwelling, 
and they settled down and they got very comfortable and they, they lived lives under the radar, trying not to be known, living in the culture, changing their names so that um, they would be singled out and, and they lived there, they settled there and that wasn't God's plan and purpose for them. Beware of being in a place where you've gotten comfortable, you've, been, you're, you've settled, there's, there's no real opposition in your life, let's not rock the boat, let's not make any waves, and a million of them throughout the, the land settled. That's just a side note. Let's see the, the last two bigger things maybe. Um, one is it's not about you. This story of God and redemption from beginning to end, it's not about, it wasn't about Esther, it wasn't about Mordecai, it wasn't about Moses, it wasn't about Peter, it wasn't about Paul. It's not about you and it's not about me. There is a bigger picture, it's the kingdom picture. And there needs to come a time in our lives where we set ourselves aside. My plan, my purpose, my agenda, my future, my dreams, my goals, and say, if I perish, I perish. When Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me, what do you do on a cross? You die. And when Esther comes to a place where she finally says, okay, it's not just about my safety and my protection. It's a bigger story. There's a people out there. God is raising up a people, a nation, a kingdom, and it's not just my story. And if I have to die to my dreams, to my future, let it be so. I'll die. The kingdom is a bigger thing than me. God doesn't bless us for the sake of blessing us. We hear it here all the time at church. When God gives to us, it's not so that I get something. It's so that I can be a channel and I can bless others. God doesn't position us simply for our benefit and for our promotion and for our good. God positions us for the sake of his kingdom. And God is positioning some of us here. You may not even be aware of it. Here's a Jewish girl just minding her own business. Obscure. Just nothing exciting going, going on in life, um, just doing her thing. And, and all of a sudden, somebody says, hey, wait a minute, Dad, you look pretty cute. <laughs> and we're taking you to Susa. The next thing she knows, in the palace, wearing a crown. And, and, and you're just minding your business, and you think God has forgotten or he can't use you. Uh, you're not that important, you're not that significant, and God's putting some things in place where maybe in a classroom, in a university, or in a high school, maybe in a cubicle on your job, uh, maybe in a place in town, in politics, maybe in your neighborhood, maybe in your family. It may not seem a whole lot like a big deal, but God is putting things into place, and we need to come to a place where we realize that it's not about me. Maybe God has put me here for the sake of something bigger than me and for somebody else. That is going to require, last thing, risk and courage. Yes. This is not risk for your sake. Oh, you know, just, you know, take the leap. Quit your job and try to get this other job or go back to school and get another career. Uh, ask, you know, the prettiest girl in class, ask her out, you know, take a risk. You never know. This isn't about you. You're not risking for you. This is about risk for God's sake. This is about walking in radical faith. This is about giving sacrificially when it hurts, when you don't have for yourself, but you give for others. This may be you quitting your job and going off to Bible college to learn uh, ministry and, and, and Bible and doctrine and, and administration. Some of you are going to be called to pass. Some of you young people are going to have to go home maybe and say, well, I know what my grandfather said. I could tell you what my grandfather told me when I was in high school. I'd be with grease under my fingernails, probably making a good living. Automatic transmission, he said. This was back in the day that that was becoming a big thing. 
And so do that. And, and, and I said, but here's God's call. He wasn't, he loved God and, and, and supported, but he just thought you're making a bad choice. Some, some of you are going to have to pack your families up and say, you know what, God's put a call in our heart to go, to, to go on a mission field. And you're going to walk away from good-paying jobs and you're going to pull your kids out of school. You're going to do some crazy things, risking for God when, he's, when he puts his finger on you and says, I've appointed you for this moment. And it's not about yourself. It's time to step out of the boat like Peter. It's time to climb Mount Moriah like Abraham. It's time to knock on a king's door like Esther. You may sacrifice, you may lose, but you were made for moments like this. A young Jewish girl in Persia, one out of 25 million that God raised up to be the queen of the world. God needed her for a moment. I'm guessing our moments aren't quite as grand as Esther's moment. But you never know. But you weren't made for Esther's moment. You were made for this moment. Would you bow your heads? We're going to sing a song. Our musicians are coming. Um, This is maybe the moment where we'll just kind of um, pray a blessing over moms and um, the influence many of you women have over the lives of others and children and grandchildren and nieces and nephews. And, um, but we want to we wanna include everybody in this blessing, every woman, every man, young person here. This is, this is a blessing that God spoke to Abraham. He said, Abraham, I want, you to, I want you to tell Aaron to speak this blessing and pray this blessing over my people. And so this morning, um, as we conclude, I want to pray, um, I want to sing this blessing. I'm not going to sing a solo. We're all going to sing this blessing over each other. Um, do you know whenever I, I hear this song taken, it's from Numbers chapter 6. When I hear this song, it kind of makes me pause and kind of settle down for a little bit and not just um, something I sing or put on in the background. It's, it's a song, it's scripture that I pray that God would help me receive. So as we're singing this and closing this morning, um, don't just sing it, but put yourself in a position to receive this in faith. The blessing of God over you, the blessing of God over your children, over your children's children. Um, this is God's promise to us. Father, I pray today that you would speak to our hearts at word of God would be stirred in us, this story of Esther, um, and we might see ourselves in this moment um, for your time, for this time. God, I pray that you would give us courage and boldness to take risks, to, to live, to lay down our lives for the sake of God and the gospel, and the kingdom. Perhaps we've been born for this moment.